Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we have uh, Professor Hutter with us. Um, uh, he's going to talk about uh, Towards Deep Learning 2.0, going to the meta level. Uh, personally, I'm most familiar with his work on Bayesian optimization, but uh, he's working uh, on a lot of other topics uh, like neural architecture search, meta learning, uh, uh, um, Autom automatic statistician kind of systems uh, and so on. Uh, he's a professor uh, at the University of uh, Freiburg um, in the uh, Department of Engineering, uh, where he's head of the machine learning lab. Uh, he obtained his PhD at the University of British Columbia. And he's also, he has been involved and he's still involved in some uh, uh, consultancies uh, I believe for Bosch Center for AI at the moment, uh, but previously for some other uh, companies. Right, um, with that, uh, please, you can start the talk and we are really excited to hear what it's gonna be about. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, one slight correction over here, machine learning is under computer science, so I'm not in, gen in engineering, but um, Apologies. Yeah, I, I think in Cambridge it would probably be under engineering or computer science, it's sort of um, <laughs> all similar there. Um, I think I misremembered that, okay. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no worries. Just for the record, uh, so nobody tells me, oh, you're, you said you're in engineering. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, th thanks for the intro. I. Um, you mentioned that I do a lot of things like neural architecture search, AutoML systems, and so on. Um, that's very right. I spend a lot of my time doing that. I'm not actually going to talk about that today, but uh, this is a new talk about, well, going towards deep learning 2.0. I'm going to the meta level here. Well, it will be a lot about AutoML, of course, but about how AutoML can pave the next, um, the future of deep learning. So um, to show you what I mean with this, uh, let's contrast deep learning 1.0, the current deep learning, with what I mean with deep learning 2.0. So deep learning has had awesome um, advances, of course, and, and has, a lot, has had a lot of successes because of its capacity of doing end-to-end -end learning of successively more abstract representations of raw data. So in this image here, we have pixels and in the, as input, and then you can learn edge detectors that's somewhere in the middle of the network, contours somewhere at the head, object parts, and that those allow you to um, really just have a linear classification in the top layer. And what's important is that Deep learning trains all these weights jointly. So it trains the early layers such that you can then on top build the middle layers such that on top you can build the higher level layers such that on top you can build this um, high level classifier. And this is not done as it used to be before where you first learn an edge detector with some system and then another system learns a contour detector, another system learns object parts. No. This is done jointly. And um, this allows us as deep learners to work with sort of any type of input data, with vision data, with speech data, with natural language. You have maybe different encoders in the beginning, but then you can use the power of deep learning for all these different types of raw data. And that has really led to a lot of breakthroughs in um, by deep learning. However, Deep Learning 1.0, the current version, still uses a fixed architecture that you need to actually put in, still uses a fixed optimization algorithm, fixed hyperparameters, weight initialization, all of that needs to actually come from the user of the system. So in a sense, we've moved from manual feature engineering to manual architecture engineering and manual hyperparameter engineering. And what I envision as deep learning 2.0 would also learn this architecture, would learn the optimization algorithm, hyperparameters, weight initialization, and so on, and do that in a way such that the inner deep learning actually works better. So I'm um, taking this um, theme from deep learning that everything is um, learned jointly, I'd also like to jointly learn the meta layer such that the base layer actually works well and optimally actually learn 
multiple parts of the meta layer such that they work together well. Learn architecture such that when you learn the, um, the right hyperparameters for it, such that you can then do the inner deep learning well. So all of that in a joint fashion. And so to visualize this differently, the current way of deep learning is in go the data, and then deep learning is, is marketed as end-to-end -end learning, but in between there's this deep learning expert who need, needs to choose architecture and hyperparameters. And this is not just one step, but it's actually this iterative procedure that can take a lot of time. Whereas deep learning 2.0 should really fulfill this, this desideratum of true end-to-end -end learning. Um, and one way of course of doing that is to have this, this meta level learning and optimization loop here that's basically doing what the DL expert does. And in between, um, inside actually as a base la layer still use deep learning 1.0 and exploit all the nice things from deep learning. Um, deep learning 1.0 also has some issues um, with many dimensions of trustworthiness, for example, fairness, robustness, calibration, interpretability, and so on. And what I would like to have in deep learning 2.0 is actually not just the data should go in, but also we can specify all the different objectives we want to optimize. For example, a particular type of fairness criterion for a particular data set or adversarial robustness, or we want uncertainty calibration or interpretability. And this box here can actually decide in a joint manner, what is the right system? What is the right architecture? What are the right training algorithms in order to, in a multi-objective manner, satisfy the user objectives. And for example, output a Pareto front and then the user can choose from this Pareto front what they would like to have. So um, this is a new talk. I'm not gonna show you solutions for everything here, but it's um, this is sort of the vision that guides me these days. And um, I'm trying to move towards this. And I would love for the community to also move along these lines. Um, so the three pillars I see for deep learning 2.0 is, well, one, this joint optimization on the meta level, but most importantly, actually this efficiency of the meta optimization. If this isn't efficient, this wouldn't work. And deep learning has taken off because it is so efficient because gradient descent can actually optimize these large networks. So we really need um, efficiency on the meta level. Otherwise, we're not going to be using it widely. And the third pillar would be this multi-objective optimization. So with this general, um, general um, introduction, let me now tell you what I'm actually going to specifically talk about today. And while this is going to be Bayesian optimization, um, and in particular, making it efficient in order to satisfy this pillar too. And also talking about joint optimization of multiple components of the deep learning pipeline, such as the neural architecture and the hyperparameters or many different hyperparameters um, of one system. And I'm also going to talk about uncertainty estimation as one of the um, possible multi-objective problems. And there I'm going to talk, well, okay, fine. I'm going to talk about neural architecture search a little bit about I'm searching an ensemble of neural architectures and about a new work that I think might, might resonate um, very well with you and there might be lots of discussions. Um, I think it's really cool, but you guys are actually the experts on, on Bayesian reasoning and Bayesian inference. So this is about meta learning Bayesian inference and I'd love to hear your feedback on that. So let's get going um, with efficiency of Bayesian optimization. So the first speed up technique I would like to talk about is to integrate user beliefs. So users, such as deep learning experts, often have some prior beliefs about where the optimizer might actually be located in the space. So if this is a distribution of where, like the probability that X is the optimal hyperparameter setting or, or short pi of X. So pi of X is just this, this p-min distribution that X um, at f of X is actually minimizer. And so one example could be people who use Adam as an optimizer typically know that its initial learning rate should be somewhere around 1e uh, to the, um, 10 to the minus 3, um, maybe give or take an order of magnitude. So you could slap a Gaussian on there centered at 1e minus 3. And that's probably going to be pretty good for any type of data set you want to use. Of course, 
Bayesian optimization directly allows users to specify a prior over functions and therefore actually express a prior belief. But this kernel function actually specifies the shape of possible functions. And it doesn't make it actually very easy to say, well, I think this is where, where the minimum is going to be. I have no idea how high this function is going to be. The prior over functions is, is P of F given X. It's not this, this P min distribution of, I think this X is going to be the optimum. And so it's not very easy to integrate that here. And well, we have one approach that's actually super simple. Um, we call it PIBO. And in that, we actually just simply modify the acquisition function, A of X, for example, EI, expected improvement, to multiply it with this um, prior belief that X would be the optimal. And this then simply favors areas with high predicted user belief of being optimal. Um, but of course, if we just used it like this, then this would constantly pay attention to the prior and we couldn't prove any, any um, convergence and so on. So in, in practice, you want to modify this slightly and decay the prior over time. Uh, for example, like this here, where you have an exponential decay of this prior over time with beta being some hyperparameter that says how important the prior is and T being the number of um, samples you have drawn. And so, that will lead to initially this prior being very important and over time it fading out. And you can actually prove a theorem that PIBO with expected improvement has the same asymptotic convergence as vanilla BO with expected improvement. This PIBO requires really minimal changes to BO. It's, it's just, um, you can use it in the initial design to get that you can use the prior belief. And then you simply multiply the acquisition function with this pi of x raised to the power of, well, sorry, here we use n for the number of steps, but um, that, that's the same as before, uh, what I denoted t the slide before. And because it's so, such a minimal change, you can put this into arbitrary code bases and um, it also works with different acquisition functions. So it, it really is, is a nice tool to have in the Bayesian optimization toolbox for cases where users can actually, well, actually have some prior belief over where the optimizer might lie. So to visualize how this works, um, here we have a, a 1D function. This is actually a 1D slice of Brannan. Then we have the, a prior um, that is say says, well, I, I think the optimum is about here. Then we have the normal acquisition function. We have three data points so far. This is the force that's going to be sampled. And with these three data points, we have EI saying, well, here is pr probably pretty good. And then away from the data here, there's high uncertainty. So um, EI is going to be high. And then you'd simply multiply the red and the blue to get this purple pi ball acquisition function, pi EI, and sample here. So this, this, is, um, this is the same figure, just smaller. And over time, if you have this well-located prior that's actually pretty close to the optimum, then well, you just keep on sampling um, at around the optimum until you've sampled there enough and the acquisition function doesn't give any weight here anymore. Even though the prior still gives weight here, you um, then start sampling over here where the acquisition function is still high. And also notice that this prior is decaying over time. So it's a little hard to see, but this is more peak than this here over time. It, it just becomes a uniform distribution. So this is a case for a well-located prior. If you have an off-center prior that's actually misleading, well, then in the beginning, you do pay a little bit of extra cost to, well, sample where the prior says you should sample. But then over time, you actually, um, yeah, the prior gets weaker and the acquisition function tells you more and more to go away from this point where, where, where you've sampled where the data tells you that the optimum doesn't lie there. So the acquisition function tells you to go away from it. And then the PIBO acquisition function also follows suit. And over time, you kind of do go over here and sample around the optimum. And, and as I said, asymptotically, this has the same convergence rates as without the prior. All right. Um, this uh, let's show some experiments. So we looked at, is PIBO robust to the quality of the prior? So if you, ha if you have a strong prior, we of course want PIBO to work better than without a prior. And if you have a wrong prior, we don't want to be misled too much. 
Um, so a strong prior here would just be a high density in the optimum region. And we compare here against prior sampling. So just sampling from your prior, that, that's of course can be a strong baseline. If you have a prior that's peaked on the optimum, then yeah, just sample from the prior once and you're done. Um, so it's not that strong here. So sampling from the prior is actually in the beginning better than just vanilla BO, which is here experiment. But um, then experiment does take over at some point, but PIBO is actually um, better. So it, so it starts faster than experiment. Um, vanilla experiment and also in the end still works better. Uh, random sampling is always worse. Um, for the weak prior, similarly, um, PIBO works very well. And for the wrong prior, this is the interesting case. There, of course, actually not using this wrong prior, vanilla BO is better, but PIBO does catch up. And in the end, actually, it does converge to the same point. Whereas here, sampling just from the prior would be horrible and, and really misleading. And this was for Brannan, uh, the same um, qualitative results are there for, for different neural network optimization and optimizing XG boost. Um, PIBO is also practically relevant and practically useful. So we used it to optimize two different deep learning pipelines. Um, one was a unit for, for semantical data set, uh, some segmentation. Um, there we got a 2.5 speed up over just vanilla BO. So um, here is, here's PIBO. Um, and um, for ImageNet, uh, that's a smaller version of ImageNet, we actually got a 12.5 um, fold speed up over just um, vanilla BO. And notice that in this case here, the, the prior sampling is actually not very good and, and wouldn't have uh, converged as well as uh, PIBO did. So, yeah, we can get up to 10 fold speed ups or 12.5 fold. But, but more importantly, I think this, this can really bridge the gaps to deep learning experts who in practice actually still do manual optimization rather than trusting Bayesian optimization. And um, this, this will take their um, beliefs into account and still actually do meaningful things under that belief. And I, I hope that this can actually bridge the gap between um, their practice and Bayesian optimization to kind of make them use Bayesian optimization more. Because there are, for example, there's, for example, this, this survey by uh, Xavier Baudelier um, and uh, Gael that uh, shows that, uh, I think, was it, I, I don't know the exact percentages anymore, but, but something like 95% of the people at uh, NeurIPS 2020 and iClear 2021 who reported doing hyperparameter optimization used either manual search or grid search. And only a vanishingly small percentage actually used something smart as Bayesian optimization. And um, I, I think, well, we as Bayesian optimization folks should try to work against this. And, and this might be a way of doing that. All right, um, so that's the first speed up technique, um, integrating user beliefs. The second one would be on multi-fidelity optimization. So um, multi-fidelity optimization is a very generic approach that um, most of you probably know. So I'm gonna go pretty fast here. This is also um, uh, yeah, published work. And the, the key idea here is to use cheap approximations of the black box. And the important thing is that the performance of this cheap approximation should correlate with the performance on the black box. You don't need to get great performance, but you need to get good rank correlations. So that if you optimize on a you know, cheap black box, what does work, what works well there also tends to work well on your expensive black box. And um, so the approximations that you could use a subset of your, of your data, you could use fewer epochs of iterative training algorithms, you could downsample your images, you could use shallower um, neural nets, you could use slimmer neural nets. In Bayesian deep learning, you could do short MCMC chains, or you could do fewer trials and deeper enforcement learning. So it's really the name of the game is to look at your particular um, problem and see how can you cheaply approximate the black box such that you still get good rank correlations of which hyperparameters do well for the cheap approximation and for the expensive black box. All right, uh, there's many different ways of doing multi-fidelity optimization. The simplest method is successive halving. 
which would, um, yeah, which is visualized here. So you just start different hyperparameter settings um, sampled at random in this case, um, continue the better half for double the time, continue the better half or double the time, continue the better half or double the time. And well, actually get to good performance with fairly little um, total compute cost. There's many more complex methods um, in particular, also based on optimization methods that model both the hyperparameter surface and the multiple fidelities. But um, actually, in, in our work, we, we saw that a combination of the successive halving method together with Bayesian optimization um, in, a, in a sort of, yeah, not as a complex manner, but really basically using uh, the success of having or the hyperband scheduling, but only choosing the hyperparameter settings to, to raise by Bayesian optimization, that actually led to very general um, and very robust general performance. And we also had, for example, this fabulous approach. This is cute and nice, but actually Bob in practice, especially for high dimensional cases or high dimensional um, yeah, or categorical parameters works actually much better out of the box. We have one other approach that um, US Bayesian optimization folks might not be so happy about. This is an evolutionary search that actually does uh, annoyingly well in a sense. Um, usually evolutionary algorithms actually require too many function evaluations to be competitive with Bayesian optimization. But actually in multi-fidelity optimization, there we can afford a lot of function evaluations at the cheap approximations. So um, here we combine differential evolution and hyperband and actually do a lot of function evaluations at the cheap approximations to get um, an idea where the optimum lies and then we'll do the same thing as we would do in Bob. And there we could actually show a thousand fold speed ups over random search and also 17 fold or 32 fold speed ups over Bob in this is hyperparameter optimization of six continuous hyperparameters of a neural net. And this here is um, NAS bench 201. So a neural architecture search benchmark. So uh, this is a, an approach that actually for higher dimensional and, and also especially these this discrete search spaces here um, is quite competitive to um, Bayesian optimization. If you have enough function evaluations and multi-fidelity happens to be a case where you do have enough function evaluations for evolution to actually be useful. Um, this can be combined with another speed up technique, namely meta learning across data sets. So um, we did this, we um, basically also did this joint optimization here. We came up with a portfolio of hyperparameter settings such that when you run successive halving method with the base level SGD, you would actually get good performance. And um, this yielded 100 full speed ups over not doing meta learning over data sets. And we used it in auto escalon 2 to win the second auto ML challenge. Um, this is sort of, a, it's, it's a pretty trivial um, initialization method that um, if you have metadata, I would definitely um, consider doing that. Okay, I'm, I'm going fast here because this is maybe not the most interesting part for, for Bayesians. So I'll, I'll also talk about some joint optimization now. These, these are applications and they'll also get relatively fast to get to uncertainty estimation. So the first application of these um, speed up techniques was um, joint neural architecture search and hyperparameter optimization. We already did this in, in 2016 or 2015, where uh, to the best of my knowledge, this was the first automated deep learning system to actually win machine learning competition data sets against human experts. So for example, there was this data set and with around 55,000 data points in the first AutoML challenge, where this AutoNet back then, based on Fiano, um, got an AUC of 0.9, whereas the best human expert teams got um, only 0.8. And they had two months time to tackle this, just like a normal Kaggle challenge. So they, they could have also done something like this, but, but they didn't. Um, yeah, because while well, messing with the architecture and the hyperparameters of that architecture is, is um, a complex problem. But actually, back then, just throwing SMAG, standard Bayesian optimization with random forest at it for, um, I think, 18 hours on four GPUs um, really yielded a very good performance already. Um, by now, we have a 
a successor of that that we call Otto PyTorch. This does multi-fidelity optimization and it does meta learning. And yeah, that, that's published in TPAMI this year. And uh, yeah, I definitely invite anyone to contribute to this and, and use it. Um, we focus there on a tabular search space. Um, so for tabular data. And so we, we don't have convolutions, for example, because for um, tabular data, you don't need them, but it's basically a shaped ResNet where we parameterize the number of blocks and the number of groups. And then, yeah, things like dropout and our different regularization techniques that are architectural like shake drop and shake shake and so on. And we also have 12 hyperparameters from the optimization pipeline. And um, this AutoML system actually does work quite well against other AutoML systems such as AutoKeras and AutoS, AutoSKLearn. Um, this is AutoSKLearn 1.0, AutoSKLearn 2.0 does, does a bit better, um, but still, yeah, it does very, very well actually. Um, and then an extension of this, we actually looked at many more different types of regularizers. So we, we implemented 13 different regularization methods and um, hyperparameters that would choose which regularizer is active and um, the, the subsidiary hyperparameters of that optimizer. And we would optimize these um, regularization methods on a per data set basis. And because it's many of them and we need the right proportion, we call this regularization cocktails. And we want to find the right cocktail for uh, the data set at hand. And surprisingly, this actually allows simple multi-layer perceptrons to actually achieve state-of-the-art performance for tabular data. So actually, for the first time in a fair head-to-head -head comparison, getting better performance than XGBoost and also getting much, much better performance than, than previous um, neural architectures for tabular data. One disclaimer here is that we only use very clean data sets, uh, quite balanced, no bad outliers, and so on. But I think this really opens a garden of delights for deep learning because deep learning hasn't so far really cracked the tabular data regime. And, and now for the first time, even with, with these simple architectures with multi-layer perceptrons, if you use the right type of regularization on a per data set basis, you actually get state-of-the-art performance better than XGBoost. And surprisingly, this is actually already better than XGBoost in um, 15 minutes, so a quarter of an hour. And as, as time goes on, up to 100 hours, you get better and better and the, the gap binds to XGBoost. And the improvements over these baselines are also clearly significant. So um, this is at Europe's this year. All right, um, so much for the applications. Um, since there are, are quite a few people doing Bayesian optimization in the room, I have one slide on benchmarks. Um, so. For, for a lot of years, uh, we as a community have, have done a lot of things on Brahmin. But, uh, and, and this is really nicely behaved. It's super cheap to evaluate. It's convenient. You can get comparable results across paper. So, um, well, I, I showed results on Brahmin before, so I don't want to diss Brahmin too much. But it might be a bit too nicely behaved, and many practical problems might be messier. Um, and because of that, we now actually released HPO Bench which is a new library that has over 100 multi-fidelity hyperparameter optimization problems. So it's also the first library for multi-fidelity optimization. You can also do multi-objective optimization with it. We have diff four different objective values for each hyperparameter setting, and we have the whole learning curve. And we have actual benchmarks with code that is um, in a container and will run 10 years from now. And we have tabular versions, and we also have surrogate benchmarks. So um, this, this should be just as easy to use as Brannon, but um, much more realistic. We also have a NAS bench suite, which is a new library of 25 tabular NAS benchmarks. So NAS benchmarks like NAS bench 101, but 25 different NAS benchmarks from the community that were all over the place with different interfaces and, and so on. And we put them all in the same interface. So you can now, if you want to apply your Bayesian optimization methods to high dimensional categorical spaces um, and also do neural architecture search, you can now do this um, in this library well, you get 25 different benchmarks for the price of um, yeah, implementing this interface once. Hi, can I ask right. a question? Yeah, could you tell me details about the sort of problems that are in the HPO bench? 
Um, okay. what sort, mm -hmm. um, so we have 88 benchmarks that, that we created new. Those are um, 20 different data sets for four different algorithms, namely um, yeah, XGBoost and Random Forest and, and things like that, and eight different data sets for multi-layer multi, uh, perceptrons. And then we have um, yeah, something like 20 different community benchmarks that we had from previous papers. There we had yeah, some, um, some reinforcement learning, some MCMC, um, also yeah, different SVMs and so on. So they, they, it's quite a, quite a range. There is not that many expensive deep learning benchmarks because, well, we actually um, wanted to evaluate a, a, a grid of hyperparameter settings. But um, while well, there are these um, eight different benchmarks for, um, for neural nets that, that we created new, where, where we have the code and the tabular versions of them. And then out of the community benchmarks from before, I think about 10 of them are about neural nets. Um, does it answer the question? Yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, if you'd like to use them, if, you, if you'd like to have something else in there and so on, uh, please let us know. Um, we really want this to be for the community. Thanks. All right, um, good. I would then, if there's no further questions, I would go on to uncertainty estimation and then maybe do questions in the end. All right, so um, there's two parts here in your ensemble, so it should be relatively fast. And then the second part, um, a little bit longer. So neural ensemble search has as its motivation that ensembling often improves the per performance of neural networks. And in particular, deep ensembles have shown to have state-of-the-art performance for predictive uncertainty estimation and robustness to distributional shift in 2019. And th this is somewhat odd to, to me because, well, they only get the diversity from having different weights and only trusting SGD to run to different parts of the response surface. And wouldn't it be nice to actually also get diversity by using different architectures? And so that's actually what we do in neural architecture search. We use neural architecture search for base learner architectures that optimize ensemble performance jointly. And so this implicitly optimizes the trade-off of diversity and individual performance. And when we look at um, all the different objectives we could be looking at, so here is um, expected calibration error and actually um, well, error one minus accuracy and ensemble negative log likelihood, these um, deep ensembles for the best neural architecture in this in the search space, this is from last bench 201, exhaustively evaluated, actually do worse in all these three different measures here. Then, um, neural ensemble search, which can actually combine, well, in this case, three different architectures rather than using three seeds of the single best architecture. The single best architecture is better in terms of the average base learner negative log likelihood because these three individual seeds, well, it's by definition that it, this makes it the best single architecture. But in terms of all the other metrics, such as the Oracle ne negative log likelihood and um, one minus a predictive disagreement, the uh, neural ensemble search methods are actually better. Um, so why is this the case? Well, different architectures indeed do make diverse predictions. So here we have a plot, a Tisney plot of five neural architectures and different, um, um, different solutions of these five different architectures and their predictions. And we see that the predictions for each of the architectures really do cluster together heavily. And here we see the predictions of fixed architecture. And here we see the predictions of the um, architectures in an ensemble found by neural ensemble search. So we have a much greater diversity if we use different architectures. Even though each of the architectures might not be quite as good by itself, the joint performance will be better. So I'm um, getting to this objective robust performance under data set shift. Um, so there we looked uh, at C5. 10C, and this comes with some validation corruptions and some test corruptions. And so what we did during the search is to actually randomly choose a validation corruption for each of the evaluations in order to 
be robust to corruptions, to in this case, validation corruptions. And of course, not look at the test corruptions, but at test time, look at the test corruptions. And this does let you get much more robust to corruptions than deep ensembles. Um, so here we have um, yeah, the ensemble size and the ensemble negative log likelihood. And both of the versions of neural ensemble search based on random search or based on um, regularized evolution actually get much better performance than the best types of um, deep ensembles. All right, um, that was just a, a quick um, overview of neural ensemble search. This is also a paper at this NeurIPS, if you're interested. Um, come talk to us at the poster um, and to the authors who know even, uh, well, to the first authors who know even more about this. Um, and now I would like to talk about prior fitted networks. This is where um, I'm most keen to hear um, what, what you guys are thinking as Bayesians. So uh, the motivation or an illustration of what I mean with these prior fitted networks. Um, let's, let's try to actually approximate posterior inference in GPs. What we'll do here is to first take samples from the prior. And we take many of these samples. Um, so we sample one curve. And from that curve, we sample some data points. And we have these blue ones. So we, we just arbitrarily take, in this case, I don't know how many, maybe 20 for as training points. And then one of them we say is a test point. And we do that a lot. And then we learn a model to predict these test points from these training points. So one, one input, one data point for this model would be the set of these blue points as input should yield the orange point with high probability. And when you put in these blue points, it should yield this point here, um, this one with high probability and so on. And we can, um, of course, sample arbitrarily many um, functions from our prior. And so we can sample arbitrary, arbitrarily many, well, um, data points for our model. And so we basically make this model encompass our prior. Because our prior tells us, knowing the shape of the prior, if I see these blue points here, and then I'm asked to evaluate here, then I'm gonna say, well, here I'm gonna have high probability. And what do we then do with this prior fitted network? Well, we have then actual new data and we query at this point here. And we simply put this into the prior fitted network, do a forward pass and get the posterior predictive distribution. And the cool thing here is that really now we have Meta learned to do approximate Bayesian inference purely by doing supervised learning on the prior with set valued inputs. And the cool thing is that this actually works extremely well. So um, in blue here, no, in green, we have the actual Gaussian process posterior distribution. And in blue, we have our predictions. And this is after training on 4 million samples from the prior. We have barely visible approximation errors. So you see the blue and the green deviate a little bit here, and the blue uncertainty is a little bit off here. But if we train long enough, the error just goes down. And it goes down pretty much to zero, because this error, as, as we'll see in a little bit, is, is really exactly the objective function that we're optimizing. So um, here's a, a more mathy or mathy looking illustration. So we sample prior data sets here. We call them data sets, not functions, but same thing. Um, so one data set is D1 and we split that into training and a test point. And we do that K times. And then we train the prior fitted network by minimizing the negative log likelihood of the Y test given the training part and the X test. And we simply do this for the K um, data sets. So the meta data sets here that can be artificial. And we get a PFN out with parameters theta star. And then we do Bayesian inference with this trained PFN by, um, by it just a forward pass, getting 
the predictive distribution of y test given x test and um, detrain this actual training data set and test input. And this then approximates the, pr the true probability because, well, um, that's, that's exactly what's being optimized here. All right. Um, then some technical parts, which model do we use for this? We use a permutation invariant transformer. Um, so we have a pairwise attention between all the input data points and the test points attend to all of the training data points, but there's no attention between the test points. So we do not model correlations between the outputs. And if you would want to draw a joint sample, you would have to draw, draw the sample for this, make it part of the input, then draw the next sample conditioned on that. Um, as a model head here, we um, well, we want to do a regression and, and regression is not really something that deep learning does extremely well with the standard um, architectures and so on. So here we actually do a regression as classification. We bin the distribution into something like a thousand bins. And these bins are just as wide as the, as the data in the prior. And um, we can either bin it like this, but if we have a distribution that um, has um, infinite support to the left and the right, then we can also make the, the final one sort of a half Gaussian here and a half Gaussian here in order to have um, support everywhere. And the shape of our distributions, of our predictive distributions is actually going to look like this here. If you, if you squint, you actually do see the binning um, yeah, it's hard to see. Uh, there's, of course, well, the, the fact that there is a, a change between here and there, that, that's just the, the plotting, the plotting for this region and then for this region. But within each of the regions, there is sort of these, uh, yeah, it's bent a little bit. But um, yeah, and the way that we're doing these plots here is, of course, if you have this bin distribution, you can compute means and um, quantiles or standard deviations, and that's what we're plotting here. And um, these predictive distributions really pretty much exactly match the Gaussian um, posterior distribution because, well, it is trained with cross entropy to actually match these in the 4 million um, training samples it has seen. And uh, here's one comparison to attentive neural processes. Um, this is where one of my question marks is, we just downloaded a collab and ran it. Uh, maybe we used it wrongly. Maybe uh, attentive neural processes could do a little bit better here. But also the plots in the paper were not exactly spot on. And, and, and it's just not optimizing exactly this objective function. But um, yeah, question? Yeah. Come go back to the previous slide. So is the idea here, so some of those black dots are what you're given and you're just trying to predict what the distribution. Um, yeah, so this, this is really just um, basically, um, like I, I showed this one for different types of, of um, so the blue dots is, the, sorry, the blue dots is the input data. And then you're predicting for any point and you can move this point over the X axis and then just get predictive distribution anywhere on the X axis. Okay, so what's going on in the, in the four plots on that, on that slide then, the one where you're trying to show? Oh, it, it was just, um, sorry, it was just an illustration of, um, if you have these five points, you get this predictive distribution. If you have this, so it, it was just to show that it was not, um, that this one here or that I showed uh, ages ago, that this was not, it's not just because it's two points only and it's not cherry picking, it, it does that um, sort of for any points. Okay, that makes sense. So the idea is that you, you'd have four data points and we want to pretend that we're doing Bayesian inference. We, we calculate the posterior across the whole of the search space. Mm -hmm. and we want to look like what we get from a Gaussian process. Yeah, exactly. So, so with these two two data points in green, you have you have the Gaussian process posterior, and in blue you have the the PFN, and they just happen to overlap so much. I don't know if you see it on your on your projector, but there is a little bit of difference here between the green and the blue. Um, there's a little bit of difference here, uh, maybe here, but overall they're just almost exactly the same. And you've trained your model for like a, is that for a particular? 
um, kernel parameters, or is that yes? Something? Yes, I'll get to this. This is for particular kernel parameters because otherwise, well, we couldn't actually plot the posterior GP because yeah, we we can't do it in closed form. But um, that here, let me see. Here is with unknown hyperparameters. We will get to that. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, first, um, this, this is scalable in the sense that, well, longer training actually makes the approximation better. Um, here we, we see, well, for a fixed number of, of data points, let's say 500 and the previous, like here, this, this would be just five. Um, so if we have 500 data points, we, we also, well, um, the GP of course gets better negative log likelihood if you, if you see more and more data points, the PFN also gets better with more and more data points. If you train with 500,000 samples, then you get this performance. If you train with a million, you get that, two million, four million. So the more training you do, the, the more you converge to the actual posterior predictive distribution. And that goes for, yeah, sort of arbitrary number of, of data points. Um, so longer training makes it better. And we just stopped up the 4 million because, um, well, it had run for a couple of hours and we were happy. We should probably run it for a week and make it uh, pretty much exactly match this purple line. Um, and in terms of the number of data points, so this is scalable to about 4,000 data points, um, not more directly because you have pairwise attention between all the input data points. So you have um, pairwise attention between the 4,000 input data points and if you go past 4,000, then uh, we run into memory issues. And, but, but there are a lot of tricks in the transformer literature to get actually linear complexity or, log, or, or n log n. And we just haven't looked at these, but, but they would be there in order to also scale this to 100,000 or a million data points. Um, so it, it can be um, a scalable alternative to standard GPs but for yeah, doing approximate inference for large data sets. Um, so far, we've done this for GPs, where, of course, well, we can also just use the GP equations and be done. But um, if we have unknown hyperparameters, it gets more interesting. And there, actually, well, we can do um, we can do just um, MLE um, two. Uh, we we can also do MCMC, and here we do MCMC with well, just too few warm up steps. Um, with is more warm up steps, it gets better and better. Um, but the, the uh, private neural networks actually um, did better across the board here um, over all the number of data points that we looked at. And granted, um, yeah, the PhD student who did this was not an expert in nuts, and maybe you can actually get better performance in nuts. But um, yeah, it was already 10,000 times slower than the PFN because the PFN only does a forward prop and the MCMC just starts from scratch um, to sample. Um, we also approximated Bayesian neural networks here and um, two different types of Bayesian neural networks, really small ones, so that we could actually run nuts and also um, stochastic variational inference. And yeah, again, we were like uh, a thousand times faster than SVI, 10,000 times faster than nuts to get to the same um, negative flock likelihood. All right. And then we applied this to tabular data sets. And this is a, sort of a, a really crazy result. Um, Sorry, can I ask a question before we go yes, to that? So can you also uh, distinguish between aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty? Can we? Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't see how, because really we just do a forward prop and we get a predictive distribution. Yeah. Um, I think there, there is a recent work by uh, Daniela Russo group at MIT. Mm -hmm. So they also have a form of prior fitted networks. Oh. They, they postulate the prior on the likelihood function. Mm -hmm. which allows them to decouple the epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty. But they, they, oh. you have to kind of make certain assumptions on the distribution and uh, mm -hmm. formulate to conjugate um, to, to actually mm -hmm. get it to work. Yeah, yeah, I must admit when, when we did this work, we were just 
blissfully unaware of all the different uh, types of work that there are in, in this way, even though we, we didn't directly make the, the connection to neural processes um, until pretty late in the game. But it, it, it just blows my mind that this is so simple. I, there, there is nothing complex here, right? We just fit a neural network and and that does base an inference. It's just strange to me. Um, so yeah, um, definitely um, I, I would love to collect uh, different references uh, from you. So, so this work by, by Russell, I'd be very, very um, keen to look at. Um, but let me um, have this. This is actually then my last technical slide and then we can have more, more questions. Um, so we, we applied this to binary classification in tabular data sets. Um, the experiment setup was that we, we wanted to do binary balanced classification for relatively small data sets. So we used 20 data sets from OpenML, uh, where for each of them we had 30 training data points and 70 test data points, and there were up to 60 features, so that different number of features. And all for all of these, um, we actually addressed this with a single PFN there was only fitted on prior data, um, so on synthetic data. And, and for that, we just said, well, the prior should just be that this data comes from a Bayesian neural network. So for that, we actually sampled a neural architecture. We didn't use a fixed architecture, but we can sample an architecture, then sample all its weights from a standard normal. Then we would um, sample the entries of the input matrix, um, IID from a standard normal. And then we would forward prop this input matrix um, through the network to obtain lo the logits. And, and then we would say, well, the 50 data points with the highest logits would actually get class one and the other ones would get class zero. So that's our prior that um, our data sets are just samples from a neural network with different types of architectures with different types of uh, weights and so on. And then, well, we learn a PFN uh, to predict the y values for the test data points, so y31 to y100, given the training data points and given the x values for um, the test data points, and given then a real training data set. So this is the first time a real training set actually enters the game. We just put the 30 training data points and the um, 70 x values for the test data points in do a forward prop through the PFN and make predictions. And the crazy thing is that this actually does better than XGBoost, better than um, GPs, logistic regression, uh, Bayesian neural network here with space by back prop. Um, yeah, it uh, in terms of mean rank, it, it's uh, here's 2.7. The next one is XGB, but um, it's statistically significantly better um, than XGB. And um, these are all with optimized hyperparameters. So the time taken here with hyperparameter optimization on each of these data points is 21 hours. Ours is a forward prop, it's 13 seconds. So, on, and this is jointly for all the 20 data sets together. So it's less than a second to predict on a new data set. And the uncertainty, so the um, calibration of the errors is also much better than, than for the competitors. And it blows my mind that just such a simple prior, just saying, well, I assume that my data comes from a Bayesian neural network, that's my prior. And then I just do a forward prop given um, this set valued input, and I can actually make well calibrated predictions for these test, test data points. It's, uh, it's really cool. And I think it just opens a lot of possibilities to do interesting Bayesian inference. All right, so the takeaways are of the talk is, well, still I, I have this vision to go towards deep learning 2.0, um, to have auto-optimized deep learning for the objectives at hand, where the user doesn't need to necessarily do deep, need, need to know deep learning, doesn't, know, doesn't need to know how to optimize it, its uh, learning rates or that there is even a learning rate, um, but they should know the user objectives and they should tell us a user objective and then deep learning 2.0 can figure out by itself how to actually get good performance for these user objectives and that that can be a really clean interface between domain scientists who know everything about fairness and calibration and um, data shift and so on 
that is important for the application at hand and tell it the system and the system tells them uh, predictions that could also be interpretable, et cetera. Um, technically, I talked about speed up methods for Bayesian optimization. So this PIBO technique, I'd also be very interested in feedback um, because that is uh, not published yet. And well, multivitality meta learning that most of you probably know, then joint NAS and HPO and joint regularization cocktails So really demonstrating that we can already do a lot of this joint optimization on the meta level. And then talked about uncertainty quantification, neural ensemble search, and these prior fitted networks. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, we can right, uh, now start with the questions and, well, feedback. Uh, well, I can, I can. Uh, start if nobody else uh, uh, uh yeah i've got a few questions um oh okay you don't mind. um yeah so i guess first point would be you mentioned permutation invariant transformer but but all transformers are are, are, are they not natively permutation invariant if we're dealing with self-attention mechanism yeah it is we drop the positional encoding it is Sorry. that <laughs> oh positional encoding yeah well that's that's entirely optional okay yeah Fair enough. so we, we didn't use it and then it's permutation invariant no magic here I, I'm yeah, not yeah, claiming okay. that this, this is, is It's awesome. just a self-attention layer. It's just a self-attention layer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I asked because a couple of years ago, there's a paper called the Set Transformer, which is mm -hmm. specifically addresses trying to get that um, permutation variance, but a little bit more interaction between the elements. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought- Yeah, and I think, I think we could probably even do better by using that. I, um, that, okay. that is sort of on the agenda, but we, we didn't use it because we didn't need it. And uh, yeah, but probably it would make things better. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, I was curious. Because, for example, last year that it was used um, by Ryan Adams, Adam Stephen Princeton to infer the hyperparameters of, of GPs. So, just instantaneously give you, instead of optimizing the guessing process, it would just give you the hyperparameters. Ooh, um, nice. So, and that would also be an interesting reference to have. If you could uh, maybe in the end post it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can do stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've been looking at similar things, but with Bayesian uh, model selection. So, I'll send, I'll send you that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very interesting and very relevant. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I was curious about other ways of incorporating user uh, priors. I mean, it surfaced uh, in our work with clients to mm -hmm. some extent. Um, they have difficulties with uh, expressing their priors in terms of uh, kernels, right, and yeah. functions. Uh, so in your investigation, have you encountered any other way of uh, doing this besides uh, uh, working directly with uh, acquisition function space? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we we did we we do have one previous paper that I didn't talk about here. It's called Bopro, um, where we basically if you work with um, KDEs, so so with Hyperop, for example, or with a tree parsing estimator. That actually directly works in the space of all well, the probability that something is optimal, and there you could actually put it in pretty directly. Um, the problem, of course, with KDEs is that they don't uh, model the function quite as well as a Gaussian process. Um, and there's one other work, this um, Bayesian optimization with um, warping the search space. So that, that warped the search space to basically say, well, that the search space gets enlarged where the prior of being of it being optimal is large and it gets smaller um, where the prior um, says it's, it's not as large. But that has, has a problem that if, if you misspecify the prior, then it, it's just, yeah, doesn't actually find the optimum. And um, yeah, in practice, it also, um, we, we have some other results where it also didn't do quite as well and where we had weak priors and, and wrong priors, it just completely tanked for the wrong priors. Um, it could probably be made quite a bit better by this decaying prior idea, but then, well, you would basically redo Bayesian optimization every single time, like every step you would change your search space because you would uh, make your search space slightly less focused on the prior and put put more weight to the parts that the prior don't um, doesn't think 
are good. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, it, it's definitely a, a really important area to look at. And this is pretty much the list of approaches out there um, for tackling it. I, I think it's, it's understudied and probably this is not the end of the journey. Um, it's just a really simple method that um, is convenient and can go into any type of uh, BO framework. And, and it has, well, for its simplicity, it has nice um, empirical results and theoretical results. And, and it's sort of surprising that such a simple change um, does so well and, and has theoretical guarantees and that nobody else did it in a sense. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that speaks to the fact how open this field still is. So if you have other ideas, uh, probably they might do quite well. You made me a little yes. nervous calling it the decaying prior because you know, we have a pretty good way of updating priors. So is there, would it be possible to recast the decay process as an update procedure? So it's a bit more, you can put on a firmer footing theoretically. Um, I just, I'm just, I'm just well, uh, apprehensive about moving away from base theorem, as, as you can mm -hmm. imagine. Well, so, I mean, with, with base theorem, you have the, the prior and then it's times the likelihood. And if there's more and more data, then the likelihood just gets stronger and the prior doesn't get stronger. And so the right. data gets stronger and stronger and the, the, the prior doesn't. And, and, and that is kind of what, what we uh, try to reflect here. Like exactly. it, it, it's only I, the intuition that carries over. It's not more than the intuition and it- like, Yeah, yeah. It would no, be I nice- guess, I guess that's why I'm nervous about calling the game prior because I prefer, prefer to stick with the traditional view which you perfectly described just there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just that, well, this is the acquisition function and it's based on data. We, um, we could also say if we have N data points and we raise this to the power of N, or in this case, T, which would be equivalent, but nobody normally raises their acquisition function to the power of T. So I'm not sure if that would uh, then make it uh, more formally, um, yeah, right in a sense. But it, it's th this term here gets better with more data and this term, it doesn't get better more, with more data. And that's why I, I think this term should get stronger over time. Yeah. I mean, it does seem effective, although you would you still need to elicit probability distributions from uh, users, which yeah, so, practically um, it might be tricky. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we did one case study that was, that was actually in the BOPRO paper where we um, actually had an, an application engineer and they defined priors. And um, yeah, and then we found something that's much better than, than what they found. Um, but for the deep learning case study, what all that we did is basically just take the defaults from PyTorch um, or PyTorch Lightning, I think, um, in this case, because we, we took implementations from, no, actually, I think this was from the NVIDIA library. So whichever library we used, we used the defaults and just did an order of magnitude below and above with, with a Gaussian. So with the standard deviation being, um, yeah, just centered around the default. And, and this is the first prior we used and um, it worked fine. But of course, this is not optimal, right? I mean, we, we know that for example, learning rate and um, batch size have an interaction effect. We, we know that um, yeah, learning rate and weight decay have an interaction effect unless we decouple them. And um, if, if we could make that into a, a better prior, um, Pybo wouldn't have any problem with it, but it's sort of just eliciting that prior and getting it into, into Pybo would be um, more of the issue. Right. But I mean, to, to some extent, what we're currently asking and in most Bayesian optimization packages, asking the user to do is just to say, this is a lower and this is an upper bound. And um, well, that is specifying a prior, but it's, it's not, well, if, if that prior is wrong, if actually the optimal value is outside of that, those bounds, there's no way we will ever find it. And, and so in a sense, that's not the best way of specifying these priors. And actually some toolboxes like HyperOp actually already allow it to, to specify a probability distribution. 
um, and not a fixed lower and upper bound, but just mm -hmm. a Gaussian or or a log normal or some other like any probability distribution. I think from from SciPy there though. And and I would just take that and not worry about it. I mean, in some ways, that that's that would ward off uh, some concerns that, in a way, you are doing uh, like empirical base here. Mm -hmm. Like, and there should be some kind of limit at. Uh, what should be optimized jointly because at least in my opinion architecture is acting as a prior um and if we are searching over like all the parameters in the architecture at some point we will hit the no free lunch theorem um so i'm, I'm just kind of worried that we cannot push it too far and how can you ward off that and it seems like potentially like having these kind of uh uh, meta priors over uh, the uh, uh, architectural search parameters uh, or hyperparameter search parameters that would still kind of act as a regularizer and uh, some kind of prior. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, I'm, I'm all for just using the prior that the human actually has. If the human does a bunch of experiments in order to get that prior, um, yeah, I, I guess it's still fine if they don't then also give the same experiments to the GP and then, then you're double counting evidence. Yeah. Are there, are there any other comments, uh, questions? If not, perhaps we can uh, call it a day. Okay. All right. Um, thank, thank you so much, much for your talk. That was great. Uh, I'm sure yeah, you can say in everybody's name. Yeah, we enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you and much. yeah, looking forward to any one on ones if, if you'd like to chat and have feedback, especially on PIBO and the PFNs, I'd be very, very interested.